My name is Mike St. John Green and I'm here to talk today about uh, cybercrime. Well, not just cybercrime, but, but I'm going to focus on that and the question, why aren't we winning? And the, as I was looking at this uh, title, I thought that's rather presumptuous. Maybe some people think we are winning, but um, I'm just going to ask for a show of hands. Who thinks we aren't winning at the moment? Okay, darn, it's not going to work, is it? Does anybody want to put their hand up and say we are winning? Excellent. Oh well, during questions you can you can uh, help us out there. Um, well, sometimes. Sometimes, yeah, absolutely. I would say that it's not an entirely bad story, but I think that there's a, there's a real issue, um, an underlying issue, which I'm going to uh, try to draw out today. A little bit about me. I'm an engineer by profession. I took an electronics degree in the 1970s. The world seems to have changed a bit since then. I spent most of my career working for GCHQ uh, over 30 years. Uh, I also worked in the centre of government in the Cabinet Office <clears throat> and a few other things. So I, I was an engineer who turned into a policy person. Uh, I now uh, have my own business and I work for a range of clients and this has led me to this perspective we have today. I, I'm going to start with the criminal's perspective on this environment of cybercrime. Then I want to talk a little bit about the government's perspective. You know, with that sort of rhetorical question, well, why doesn't government just fix it? I mean, isn't that what they're there for? It's what the police are there for with normal crime after all. And if not the police, why doesn't the IT department just fix this? For most business, uh, uh, most business environments, I think still the assumption is that this is an IT problem and the IT department should simply protect the users. Seems a reasonable argument. Let's, let's exa uh, examine that. Um, and what will be our collective response? I think the, by the end of this uh, discussion, I want to at least show this. This is no longer just a question of prevention. Uh, you'll hear this from other people, I'm sure, that uh, it isn't a question of stopping bad things happening. It's also a matter of what are you going to do when they do. But above all, I think we face some very difficult questions about this very environment that uh, we've built here. So, starting with the criminal's perspective, I, I hasten to add that this isn't a first-hand exposition of a criminal's perspective. It's a second-hand one. But do you remember when serious crime involved pictures like this? It involved physical seizure. It involved escape, often at high speed, with squealing of tyres and people like Dennis Waterman when he was a young man. Uh, this was from the Daily Mail about uh, July last year. I'll leave it to just glance down there. Bank robberies fallen from 847 to just 108. 20 years. Criminals prefer sophisticated raids using computer technology and card fraud on the rise. Bank robbers now are online. Cybercrime is booming and, um, and actually cybercrime is being performed in an increasingly professional way, uh, if you'll excuse that expression. In my presentation today, I'm going to draw on, I'm going to make some assertions, but I'm also going to draw on some evidence. And the first uh, source I'm going to take is uh, from Dell SecureWorks. And some of you may use this service. Dell offers um, what I would call a sort of cyber security intelligence function. Look at the headlines, though. Underground hacker markets are booming with counterfeit documents. It's all about identity. We heard that from, from David earlier. But the last line, 100% satisfaction guarantee, money back if not fully satisfied. Online help, 24 by 7 help desks. This is the cyber crime world. This is the perspective of the criminals. This is just a glimpse. I'm not going to dwell on these, but price 2013, price 2014. It's not the prices that matter. It's the fact that this is a commodity market. Different prices for different countries, the US and the UK, for example, being distinct as drawn out in that table, all to do with chip and pin, I'm told. Let's look at uh, another there. Remote access Trojan. Uh, these are rental prices. You rent them by the hour, by the day. And if you have trouble, you contact the helpline. They'll explain where you're going wrong.
There's a pretty consistent message across the industry, and let's have a look at a couple of other sources now. This is uh, PwC, changing face of fraud. Actually, this report is broader than just talking about um, cybercrime. It's actually talking about fraud generally, and you won't be able to read the uh, small print down at the bottom, but you can see it says 54%. So that's over half of respondents, it says there, um, felt the number of instances of economic crime had increased over the past two years. So economic crime generally is up, say, more than half the number of people. That's the, the, the message really from there. But it goes on to say that the, the face of fraud is changing. The nature of it is going online. Nearly two-thirds of respondents felt their awareness of cybercrime was greater than it had been two years ago, despite the fact that its reporting has fallen. So there's a bit of a, 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 bit of a dichotomy here. People think they, they feel it's getting worse, but actually our, un, our reporting seems to be poorer than it had been. It is being underreported. The 93% for those at the back says um, it is about 93% uh, feeling that cybercrime is unreported. So let's move on to another source. Let's investigate what, what, what is cybercrime. And I'm going to draw on the Verizon uh, annual breach report. Oh, thank you. This came out um, a, a autumn of last year. I actually spoke at the, you'll see this in a minute, the evidence, but uh, of me writing all over the report because I spoke at the, uh, the UK launch of this report in the autumn. The key message from Verizon is that this amorphous environment of cybercrime can actually be categorised. Now, they didn't just dream this up to write the report. They've been doing this for a decade now. Uh, and there is some work some of you may be aware of on the classification of cybercrime or, of, of online malicious activity uh, under the name of Veris. But let's look at this um, rather nice sky at night constellation image. And I'm going to mess up your camera now, I'm afraid, because I'm going to walk over here. Down here, you've got point of sale intrusions. That point of sales where you put your credit card into the, uh, the, the thing they bring to your table at, um, at the restaurant. And over here, we've got cyber espionage. Then we've got this Milky Way. And I'm going to investigate that piece in a moment. Before, oh, let's do that better. Right, before we do, let's expand that. What they've concluded, looking back over the last 10 years, is that this pattern works for 92%, so it's a pretty good way of breaking up what's going on. And let's now zoom in on that area. So for me, the key message is that this, down the right hand side here, is largely about people. It's largely about people who have privilege. The insider, perhaps. We've got to be careful about whether those insiders are malicious or not. And down the outside, uh, down the left-hand side there, uh, DOS attacks, crimeware and web attacks tend to be the external. Now, the reports uh, uh, go on to analyse uh, by sector financial services for those who are involved in financial services. And it's, it's an area I work with quite a lot, quite a few of my clients. It, it actually says something that resonates with me that financial services are quite worried by uh, DOS attacks and, and web application attacks. If you think about a bank, that sort of, that makes sense. But there were some other things that caught my eye in this report, which I'd like to show you now. When I saw this graph, here's my handwriting on it. It says cybercrime goes online. Uh, what we have here are uh, the number of breaches per threat actor, and the threat actor is rather dim, maybe. It says internal, partner, and external, and external just takes off between 2007-2009. I wouldn't worry too much about the trough in 2012. I think that's just uh, vagaries of uh, statistics. And I've no reason to think that that curve won't be accelerating when further statistics come out. The second thing that I took from this report, this is actually a copy from the report with my axes because they, I think they intentionally made the axes faint so you couldn't photocopy the report. What does this mean? It's quite complicated as a presentation. Nearly every compromise takes less than a day. The time to compromise, more than three quarters of compromises are less than a day. 
less than or around a quarter of compromises are discovered within a day. That's what that says. But then there are some rates of change on there. So the first point, the attackers are faster than the defenders, but the attackers are getting better than the defenders year by year. It's getting worse. I, I have a bit of a problem with this statistic. I mean, it's a lovely argument, but I, I'm just going to make a parenthetical observation that um, it suggests that, that, that uh, attackers are a sort of smash and grab activity. I don't think they are. They're in it for the long game. They may take months. They, they will um, perform reconnaissance. They have all the patience in the world. It's not costing them a great deal to, to, to sit there on your network and look for things. So I wouldn't go away with that um, particular point. Nonetheless, the time to compromise can be extremely quick. Right, another source. This is Ernst & Young. Get ahead of cybercrime 2014, their survey. And um, I'm going to show a couple of statistics out of here. One of them is, I need my glasses to read it. Who or what? do you consider the most likely source of attack? And let's pick two of them out. Um, now, you notice that they've, they've divided this into the grey and the yellow. You've got, uh, you know, who are the people? You could call it the vector. And then you've got the, what is their motive? Are they criminals? Are they state-sponsored spies? Um, are they hacktivists, etc.? And to me, some pretty clear things come out. Who wins? Uh, are there any accountants in the room? Quick show of hands. No one are prepared to admit to it. Well, um, for the arithmetically inclined, I know this doesn't add up to 100, but if you go to the report, there's a reason for that. Apparently you can vote early and vote often in terms of their, their survey. So, employees and criminal syndicates. And employees can be witting and unwitting, of course. We are not distinguishing here. The second one... So the first one, sorry, the first picture, let's just go back, beg your pardon, that was a static picture. Let's look at rate of change. Let's look at how it's shifting. Which threats and vulnerabilities have most increased your risk exposure in the last year? They were asked for 2014. This is about threats. The first slide. Which threats have most increased? Cyber attack to steal financial information. Back to identity again. Intellectual property is in there, and disruption and defacing is in there. How is it done? Let's look at the vulnerabilities. What are the, what are the vulnerabilities that have most increased your risk exposure over the last year? This is very interesting to me. Outdated policies, rules, and careless or unaware employees. It's back to, well, I think that that's not, that's, uh, that's not intended to include the, uh, the witting, the malicious. That's just careless. But I don't think those two things are entirely unrelated. And I'm going to ask you a question here. Look into your consciences as I ask this question. Have you never been faced with a dilemma in your organisation of either getting the job done or obeying the rules? Don't need to put your hands up. And how many times have you been faced with this policy dilemma issue because the policies are simply unworkable, they're unreasonable, they're rather crazy, they're sort of risk avoidance policies by the security department saying, for example, you can't use USB drives, failing to recognise that that's actually how the world works under some circumstances and not offering a workaround. So I think that uh, the, the, that is the presenting problem for many organisations today. So where are we now? Well, I think it's crime that is the, the big issue, although um, loss of intellectual property, espionage, uh, industrial espionage mustn't be under, uh, um, underestimated, but I'm, I'm here to talk about cybercrime really today. I believe it's getting worse for us. I believe the criminals are getting better faster than we are. And that the vulnerabilities are frankly, people and poor policies in many cases. In other words, there are still some early wins. Um, a lot of what is going on is really at that sort of low level of poor hygiene. And we heard that from the previous speaker. There are things that we really shouldn't be experiencing still, but we are. Let's just see another source here. 
This came out, I think, about January of this year. This was the, uh, the Cisco equivalent. You notice that every large organisation has one of these reports, and what I'm really saying is there's a pretty consistent theme going on in what they're saying. And, um, well, I think I just said that. The adversaries are developing new techniques. They can evade detection and hide malicious activity. Um, which means, of course, the defenders, us in many cases, those of us who are in this profession, have to get better uh, all the time. But th the third line is the one that I really want to draw out. Caught in the middle are the users. As the techniques for defending the systems get better, the attackers go to the weakest link, and the weakest link has become the user. They're caught in the middle. They're complicit enablers of attack. Um, and I think we're losing ground. But can I just say, at this point, I get pretty cross with my colleagues who say, well, the users are stupid, they shouldn't click on these links. Why? Why do I have to be so careful? What is wrong with this system that, actually, as an engineer, that we have built? When I eat my cornflakes in the morning, I don't tip the packet out on the table and pick out the poisonous ones because, because somebody is trying to catch me out. So why do I need to do this in this environment? There's a fundamental problem which I will be developing a little bit. So I'm by no means down on the user. I'm down, I'm afraid, on the people who are developing the environment and, uh, and why this is happening. So, uh, last one on this. Before we move off the perspective of the criminals, this was the RAND review uh, version uh, summer 2014. Cybercrime has the upper hand in its duel with the law, they said. And one of the points here, uh, as I move on to government, is, well, you know, what's wrong with the law? Why can't we just catch and prosecute these people who are doing bad things? Well, unfortunately, as Rand points out, the law is effect ineffective in many cases because we live in sovereign nations um, with jurisdictions and boundaries, but this is a transnational, this is a global activity. And unfortunately, the nations don't entirely cooperate with each other, as we will ex explore in a second. What they did say, though, which I thought was really interesting, is if the law can't deal with this, then perhaps business can help out. We can um, disrupt the business model. Maybe a point for questions if that doesn't make any sense, but um, you might want to think about how you would disrupt the criminal business model. So that was the perspective from the criminals, and I'll now ask that rhetorical question, so why doesn't government just fix this? What are, or better still, what has government been doing all of this time? What is their focus? And I'm going to, of course, I'm not going to tell you anything from my background. This is in, all entirely from open source, but perhaps informed by what I, I recall as being topical when I was in government. Report from FireEye on a group they call APT28, um, and they discover that uh, APT28 targets the sort of stuff that would likely be of benefit to the Russian government, but of course nobody can prove it, because one of the characteristics of this environment is the difficulty of uh, attribution. This is what I expect my government to be worrying about, frankly. What are these people interested in? If you read the report, well, it's things like getting into our <clears throat> power networks, stealing certain kinds of intellectual property, such as from defence agencies. This is right and proper government stuff. You may recall, actually I'll just mention before I go to, pardon me, back one, I'll just mention uh, there's another report which I don't have in here about Operation Cleaver, which is about Iran, for example, and you can imagine the sort of things that they're interested in. The report on Iran talks about the activities being revenge for Stuxnet, etc, etc. Some pretty high stakes going on there, I think. Do you remember, and this is, this is actually March <clears throat> 2013, so quite a while ago now, two years. What was the debate all about then? The White House demanded Monday that the Chinese government stop the widespread theft of data. The demand made by in, a, in a speech by President Obama. Public confrontation with China, establishing global standards. The importance of global standards here is that if we're going to fight cybercrime, we basically have to agree what's acceptable and what isn't acceptable online. And if we can't agree with major power blocks what's acceptable online, then the underlying sort of 
uh, activities of police and other law enforcement agencies is on a dodgy foundation. That's the point here. And what I'm really saying is, you know, the global power blocks at the moment are arguing about bigger things. They aren't yet in a position to talk about detailed cooperation. Cooperating Cooperation does take place, but uh, not as well as it should. So what happened to that story? It's a rhetorical question. I will show you the answer. But, you know, have we heard much about this challenge against other nation states of late? No. Well, funny old thing that. Uh, let's see. This is a quote <clears throat> from a Chinese newspaper translated, trans transliterated. Snowden. Don't take the moral high ground. I think that's what that says. So the last thing that really came out of the, uh, the White House and or Downing Street on this, I think, was um, this, is, this is pretty much bang up to date. 16th of January of this year, um, Obama and Cameron meeting. Uh, Newly strengthened partnership against cybercrime, says the BBC. The actual quotes, cyber security and cyber attacks, slightly broader. Actually, what he's talking about, they're talking about is slightly broader. But cybercrime is what the BBC chose to, to pull out there. And I think what this shows is that um, the, the government is now broadening is recognising this, this much, much more severe threat from cybercrime and is actually broadening, it, broadening its attention to uh, look at this topic. You know, and there are questions here about using the sort of state apparatus that you would normally reserve for uh, state on state uh, for use against criminals. It's, uh, it's a topic that I, um, we can come back to in questions if you really want to. But I'm not going to pursue now here. So that's what government has been doing. And, and for me, that's why they can't just fix this, because this is a global activity. Uh, but uh, so the third, the third question was, why can't the IT department just fix this? Now, as an engineer, I could deep go into some nice techie talk, but I'm not going to. I'm going to actually take something from Scientific American as my first. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I've said that bit. State apparatus will now start looking at tackling the cybercrime activity, more than they had in the past. So, this is from Scientific American, the age of digital entanglement. And uh, there's, a, there's a guy called uh, Danny Hillis wrote an article which I thought really captured this very nicely. In our intertwined world, now think back to the previous speaker, everything being connected. He goes on to say, this individual goes on to say, difficult to understand the very systems we have built and how to repair them. The picture is too big to comprehend, he says. Now, when I look at this problem, I use expressions of messy complexity and hyperconnectivity, which are terms that other, others use in this space. Everything being connected to everything else means that it's very difficult to understand now this information system that we have built and make it secure. There's a loss of boundary. Each of us has a home or a part of a business for which we're responsible or both. Where's your boundary gone? We got that from the last speaker. That boundary, that router is no longer some kind of front door which you can shut and keep people out. And that loss of boundary means that the system that we're considering is far more complicated than I think we give credit to. Why is that? I mean, why is this so messy? I made an assertion there. You might at this point be thinking, why is he saying that? I don't believe it. So I would like to share with you some statistics. Who's read War and Peace? No, no, yeah, War and Peace. Go quick, quick show of hands. You have. Well done, Adrian. OK, nobody else. But you know it's pretty big and it'll, it'll certainly keep a door open or closed. It's... 40,000 pages. The top of this graph here of code bases says a million lines of code is equivalent to 14 independent versions of War and Peace, 14 different parallel versions. Can you get your head around War and Peace? It's pretty hard. 14 versions, I think, is round about the limit of an individual, maybe arguably more than that. Let's just look down this graph and see what we've got. 
Windows 3.1, for those who remember it, 3 million lines of code. Sorry? Is it too much? Or too... Oh, 42 one piece. Thanks for doing the arithmetic. Yes, I wasn't quite there. Right, let's, let's quickly skip through here a few more. You can see where this is going. Look, there's plenty of space left on this graph. You know where I'm heading, don't you? There's Firefox. NT 3.5, for those who remember those glorious days. Let's move on. Here we go. Now, Windows 7. 40 million lines of code. Our previous speaker mentioned cars, didn't he? He asked, are you concerned about your car being hacked? That's why I'm concerned about my car being hacked, and now my car's nothing special. It's a very basic, well, no, well, not basic, but it's a Ford Mondeo with you know, all the bells and whistles, many of which are unhelpful, frankly. Why does my car need 100 million lines of code? And what's it all doing? Why is it there? Well, it's there because the way we build software, the way the market builds software is aggregating previous versions of things, building upon building upon building different modules. My car's running all sorts of weird protocols I don't need because they get brought in in the way that we, in the marketplace, build our software. And by the way, if you're interested in hacking cars, go to a, do a quick Google search. Well, how do we survive for Google? Anyway, go, go online and search on DARPA and hacking cars and Bluetooth or something like that. And you'll find out that um, it's the Bluetooth protocol they use. That one where you, uh, you, know, you use your phone to connect to the car, that protocol. That's how they hacked into it. And, and at this point, you might say, well, 100 million lines of code, yes, but it takes quite a lot to have a floor of vulnerability, doesn't it? No, it takes one line of code. One line. This is a man in the middle attack. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here about what a man in the middle of attack is, but you can sort of get the idea from there. You think you're talking to the web server, but you're not. You're talking to someone else. One line of duplicated code. If you've got an Apple product, you may have heard of GoToFail. One line of code meant that the security software was not working. It opened all Apple products running that protocol up, the appropriate protocol up to a man in the middle attack. A bug that had been in plain view for over a decade. Because surely that wouldn't happen, would it? In open source code. Heartbleed. Leaks cryptographic keys enables you to do that man in the middle attack. Yes, OK, but doing a man in the middle attack requires a real nerd, doesn't it? No. I don't think Betsy Davis made this up herself. I think she was given a crib sheet of instructions, but they weren't difficult. So my lessons from this are, ha software has bugs. Not all will ever be discovered. It takes one error, very small error, sometimes in plain view, sometimes a really very simple error. Go to fail was one line duplicated erroneously. Some of those are discovered by the wrong people and exploited. All systems have undetected vulnerabilities. It's axiomatic. My car must have 100 million lines of code. It would take decades to find them all. So isn't there a technical solution to all of this? Well, yes, but. So this is back to the question to the IT department. Frankly, it is cheaper to get the design right than to fix it later. I mean, immeasurably cheaper, but the market will deliver flawed software because we're rewarding the market. The market, sorry, rewards vendors for being there first, not for being there right. I don't believe adding security technology to the current systems can protect us because of their complexity because of the loss of boundary. You can't put a magic shield or a shell around these systems anymore. It's just not like that. And there's a report from a company called Forrester who are actually saying the system is too complex now to be able to trust everything. We actually have to change the trust model. This is a comment for the sort of systems engineers, if there are any in the room, but I think it's about breaking up the system into domains of limited into domain trust. You've got to break it up a little bit, a bit like, a bit like social activity, really. You don't trust everybody all the time. The IEEE said about half of all security breaches are possible because of flaws in the software's architecture and design. The rest result from bugs in the software's implementation. 
The overall design may appear sound, but in some aspects the execution fails. Um, that's, well, the professional body I belong to is the IET, with a bow to the BCS, another excellent uh, organisation of course, um, the IEEE being the US uh, equivalent. Now there was a, an individual in the United States who uh, came up with, uh, let's just see, no, I beg your pardon, I've missed something point I made earlier, the user has therefore become a key part, complicit in all of this because they are now um, a weak link. <coughs> Frankly, because the user is not in many cases presented with adequate information to make an informed judgment. You must have had an error message that comes up saying this certificate has expired. What do you want to do? Gobbledygook option one or gobbledygook option two? Well, I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm being asked to answer that question. Um, so. This is a man called Richard Danzig, an absolutely brilliant uh, quote as far as I'm concerned, and uh, I'm going to develop this just a little bit. I'll explain who he is in a minute. Even as they grant unprecedented powers, they also make users less secure. Richard Danzig, <clears throat> from surviving on a diet of poison fruit, uh, he sits on the United States of America President's uh, Intelligence Advisory Board. He's uh, on the Board of Trustees of RAND Corporation, a member of the Defense Policy Board. You've got the idea. Uh, he comes up with six, sorry, five different things, which I'm going to now read out. The, their communicative capabilities, he's talking about systems, the information systems, their communicative capabilities enable collaboration and networking, but in so doing, they open the doors to intrusion. Their concentration of data and manipulative power vastly improves the efficiency and scale of operations, but this concentration in turn exponentially increases the amount that can be stolen or subverted by a successful attack. The complexity of their hardware and software creates great capability, but this complexity spawns vulnerabilities and lowers the visibility of intrusions. We don't know what's going on. Cyber systems responsiveness to instruction makes them invaluably flexible, but it also permits very small changes, one change in the line of code, very small changes in a component's design or direction to degrade or subvert system behavior. And these, and this is really, really gets the prize for me. These systems empowerment of users to retrieve and manipulate data democratizes capabilities. But this great benefit removes safeguards present in systems that require hierarchies of human approvals. The systems of controls are subverted by the very capabilities of these systems. And so, in sum, cyber systems nourish us, but at the same time they weaken and poison us. And this is the dilemma I really wanted to bring to you today, and I wanted to justify in my run-up. But it would seem um, <clears throat> wrong to, to, to stop at that point. I just want to add a couple, other, a couple more slides of, you know, so what, why is this difficult and what do we do about it? This is the consequence, in my view. I don't think this is happening yet, but I start to see signs of people becoming less trusting. And yet this is an environment in which we are utterly dependent. There is no plan B, there's no going back. You know, most companies used to have paper phone books. They did when I started work. Now, if the network goes down, frankly, we can all sit around and chat and then go home early. I think the prize for businesses, and I, would talk, I talk to banks about this, is to maintain, re-establish and maintain trust in these systems and explain why their bit is better and trustworthy. So what's to be done? I think there's an inevitability about things going wrong. So rather than talking about security, which to me suggests some kind of bastion, a wall and keeping things out. We're talking about resilience, which has two parts to it. The ability to resist, but also the ability to rebound and recover when things do go wrong. Given that our boundary has gone, we are joined to our suppliers, clients and our opponents. A friend of mine's um, military officer, uh, 
general rank and he says he's got this great thing it's from the marines u.s marines and he says um uh, when the enemy is in range so are we <clears throat> we're connected the network puts us in range getting a better balance between the two and i think what this means is that this is not something that the it department can simply fix that the board can say to the IT department or the CIO, uh, this is your risk, I'm gonna hear about it, you know, we're there to make money, you're there to keep this away from us. This is now such a deeply embedded part of our businesses, almost all our businesses, that it's a risk at the business level. And, oh, and please, let's, let's get users on side and deal with some of these rules and stop trying to put the issue onto the user to arbitrate between doing the job or abiding by policy or having to answer ridiculous questions for which you have not been provided the, the means to answer. Um, this is the bastion. I'm afraid there are holes in the walls, the walls have broken down. What we value is outside the wall as well as inside and the bad people are inside as well as outside. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.